Let's see here. Oops. P O D C A S T. Podcast. A digital audio or video file or recording, usually part of a theme series that can be downloaded from a website to a media player or computer. Cool. This is my first one. So my guest today is Theron Hutton, Dr. Theron Hutton. Yeah. And we get to talk fairly often, but not like this, not one-on-one. -on -one. Right. So thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having me. So you're a doctor, but yeah. not just a doctor, you're a functional medicine doctor. Yeah. What's the difference between those two? To me, a functional medicine doctor is really the kind of doctor that most doctors would be if they had the time uh, and sort of the, the avenue to do it. So much of ill health and medicine is broken relationships. So broken relationships with, with your environment, with your neighbors, with your family, with your self. Mm -hmm. And um, and really, I mean, to me, health from a sort of a bigger perspective is restoring those relationships. And so I've just set up my situation where I can do that. I can just take more time, 30, 45 minutes, an hour with many people. Which is super unusual today. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think on average, you know, eight minutes is, is what the average doctor spends, you know, in a room with a patient. Mm -hmm. And that's a fairly recent thing. Like, since I met you, you yeah. turned that direction. You were a general practitioner before? Yeah, I was working for a hospital at a pretty conventional clinic um, and kept getting in trouble because I was talking too much about, like, nutrition and, and you know, getting people in shape and things like that. And so I figured that maybe I need to make a move. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think it was luck. I think it was just yeah. God's plan. But yeah. I met you and Joey, and then I met Aaron. Yeah. And then Aaron introduced me to Jill. To Jill, yeah. And I was expressing my frustration with sort of what I was doing versus what I wanted to do as a physician. And and then, you know, I, I met Aaron really quickly after yeah. I met you. Mm -hmm. He was visiting and, you know, and he uh, was like, well, that sounds exactly what Jill, Jill does. You need to talk to um, my wife, mm -hmm. I think, at the time. And I was like, all right, I'll talk to her. And I talked to her. And, and she was like, here's what I do. I do this and this. And I'm like, that's it. Like, I mean, just like, it was one of those just light bulb moments. And it really just, you know, I, I mean, I remember sitting in your living room. Mm -hmm. Aaron was right by the door in the chair and he was just talking to me. And I was like, that's it. Like, that's the answer. That's like, amazing. You went out on a limb, started your own practice. Yeah, started my own practice. Um, had had no money saved up. Mm -hmm. um, it, was, it was definitely... Uh, a move of faith for me and the family and my wife and my poor wife <laughs> good grief you know going from a you know pretty secure doctor job mm -hmm. salary to i don't want to do this anymore i'm going to try something else um with a completely different model completely different model not really sure it was going to work you know kind of new not taking insurance which is yeah. um and and not even really having a ton of connections kind of being relatively new to the area not well networked. Mm -hmm. um, I know that was one of the things that that uh, connected Joey and I to you and Sarah was you you were questioning you know you were questioning things and we have been doing that for a long time. Yeah. Just you know the things that we've taken for granted all these years. At some point, I don't know if we get older or I'm not sure what it is, but. I think a lot of us find ourselves really looking at it and asking questions that we never asked before in one healthcare stuff. Yeah. And so we were both drawn to where you were going. Like yeah. that's that's where we want to go. And so we immediately left, you know, the doctor that we were seeing before, everything we were doing yeah. just changed. We're like, we're going where you're going. How much does that cost? Yeah. It doesn't really matter. Yeah. We're going where you are. And then we started telling everybody else. And uh, the general concept, like just for people to know is, Explain what it kind of looks and feels like. Yes, you get to have more time, but you have a certain number of patients yeah, in general. It, yeah, so the the term that we use now is like kind of direct care or direct primary care. And essentially it's, uh, it's a, you know, it's a bit like having your own personal doctor and cross that with like a gym membership. So right. um, in order to keep things, you know, 
healthcare is a mess. No, you know, and one of the reasons healthcare is a mess is because of the cost. It's too expensive. It's unpredictable. You go, you show up for a test, or you show up at a hospital, and you get some stuff done, and you have no idea how much it costs you or your insurance company or what the bill is going to be, and nor do the people that work there. Right. And it's just bizarre, in a way, to think about going and getting some sort of service, and nobody involved in giving mm -hmm. that service has any idea how much it's mm -hmm. going to cost. Um, and that just didn't <clears throat> feel right to me, too. So, you know, how can we um, make this predictable and cost effective for families and me mm -hmm. um and so so basically yeah you just pay us a little bit a month and you can come in get a hold of me i j was just on a phone call outside with a patient mm -hmm. and um i mean so far people have loved it yeah and you know, I think for a lot of reasons. Yeah. So, do you find a lot of other doctors and medical people kind of heading your direction too? It, it does it... seem like a lot of, like, especially primary care doctors are uh, certainly contemplating doing this and and moving in that direction. Uh, you know, the trouble with being a doctor and then having a boss or having other people tell you what you can and can't do and what they're willing to pay for and not pay for, in a way that can handcuff. Yeah, your ability to do what you think the patient needs to have done. So I think doctors that that is important to, and there's a bunch of them out yeah. there. That's that's a model that works for them. One of the things that uh, Joey loved about how you handle things is that your first response is always something other than medication. It's it's usually let's see is there something is it in your diet is it in your sleep is it in something else that's going on. And we like the personal responsibility of that. Like yeah. we, we don't want to run to the doctor and have you give us something. There are times that that needs to happen, yeah. but what we really like is to say, is there something I've done or something yeah. I could be doing better? And, and so that really resonated. Uh, another thing that made us become fast friends, besides we're neighbors and you're a doctor, is that you, like me, have a little one with almond eyes. Yes. Yeah. And that's that's how I remember meeting your family. That's, was yeah. You guys were at, uh, I had heard about you from my sister Marcy, but you were at Marcy Joe's one day, and I was in there. That's our little family restaurant. Yeah. And I came up, and you had uh, Caleb. And yeah. Caleb was, you know, he was maybe six months yeah. old or something. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we had... A newborn you know yeah. ours was brand new indiana was brand new and we didn't know really anybody that had children with down syndrome mm -hmm. and in particular we didn't know anyone who was going to go down a different path the way that we were going to go down that path like my wife had decided early on yeah. you know at least for the first few years you know we're 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 gonna like stay away from uh dairy, sugar, gluten, mm -hmm. all kinds of things. Because what we found was little ones with Down syndrome, the parents that we were around, mm -hmm. I don't know what it was, but it was almost like they felt like they needed to reward little ones more. And, yeah. and so they you know, let them have more sugar, more candy, more whatever it happens to be. And Joey just didn't want to do that. And we, we were kindred souls where you guys felt the same way. It's like, we're going to take our own path. Yeah. You guys are kind of homesteaders the same way right. we are. You yeah. you live on a farm, um, and your kids are outside all the time. Yeah. Uh, you have eight children Eight now. kids. And Caleb is fifth or sixth? Uh, sixth? So he is, yeah, he's number six. six. And now Caleb uh, and Indiana go to school here at the One Room Schoolhouse right down the road. And your another son, right. Ezekiel, yeah. goes. Ezekiel started. Which is pretty amazing because also we're related now. Yeah, kind exactly. Of, because we're, when right. Indiana was about six months old and Caleb was a year old or something like that, Joey and Sarah got together and decided that they were betrothed right. that they were going to get married someday so whenever i see caleb he doesn't know yet but he's my son-in-law <laughs> yeah, yeah. and indiana yeah. it's like yeah. yeah i i i don't know how to break it to her that it's like it's already happened it's arranged yeah. but um anyway so that's been really fun is is to have this connection where your mm -hmm. god has given you something special yeah. the, all of our kids are special but sometimes like you, you ra you've raised a lot of children, but 
you know, Caleb has his own things, and Indy's different. She's ex exactly the same as Heidi and Hopi in most ways, but in other ways, she's she's just a, a little different in a, in a good, good way. Oh, yeah. How has it been for you raising Caleb and raising a little one with Down syndrome different than the other kids? Mm -hmm. What's What's some of the differences, and in particular, the difference between like how you thought it would be and how it is? Yeah. Um, I, well, you know, I've never, I've never raised a kid with Down syndrome in a different scenario, so yeah. it's hard to compare a little bit, but I mean, I think when, um, we first learned that we were going to have a kid, so it was just a whole interesting story. We were actually living overseas in Uganda when yeah, we you found were a out. Yeah, you in Uganda. Yeah, that, that we about yeah, that. um, and so we needed to move back with a lot of unknowns um so so we you know we had a lot of fear we had some anxiety we um you know we've just been my wife and i are both um highly sort of we're motivated we're into a lot we're moving from one thing to the next we're both into exercise and work we're just movers and we get you know we get up and we just have a lot of things we want to get done throughout the day pretty task oriented um, especially my wife and she would admit this and so um, we we were you know wondering how having a kid with down syndrome was going to affect that in a sort of almost selfish yeah. way but um, but it really has made us like when we go hiking now we're walking, you know, and we're we're wanting to move and hike, you know, and get get some ground covered, but Caleb's not. <laughs> he's he's either happy to walk real slow, um, he just walks slowly. But if he sees somebody or he sees something, he's gonna stop, and he's gonna you know talk to them. And if they smile, you know, he'll stop and wave and you know say nice person. And um, so it's made us it's made us have a different pace to our life yeah. um, that we probably wouldn't have otherwise. Right. And I think it's been a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you have to slow down. Yeah. Um, and um, I mean, you know, and, and, and saying that Caleb is slow is true. Like yeah. he is slow, yeah. but it's, it's never been bad. Like I've never looked back at his slowness and said, that's been bad. Yeah. It's always been for the good. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. um, and I, you know, and I, you know, we have seven other kids though. Yeah. So I think our inclination might be if we didn't have those kids, um, is to pour everything into him. Right. But interest, it's interesting that he doesn't get that, you know, yeah. and, and, and I think in some ways it's probably made him res resilient in yeah. ways that he wouldn't be. Yeah. Um, but also he's got seven other siblings that help too, you right. know? So it's just, it's an interesting dynamic, really. And he loves, I know he does, he loves going to the schoolhouse. Oh, he loves it. He's so sad right now. Every <laughs> so two sad, things yeah. that he wants to, it's his school <laughs> and he's, let, he's letting Ezekiel come to his school. Yeah, that's, that's a new thing. Yeah. His little brother gets to come to school now yeah. too and he wasn't up for that for a yeah. while. And then Buddy Ball, his baseball team is canceled right now. He's just like he's every day, it's, school yeah buddy ball <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, but, right. how long have you been a doctor uh let's see i finished my training in 2003 and Seven what years. made you want to become a doctor I mean, a girl. you just always a girl, a girl. <laughs> a girl. <laughs> yeah the girl you're married to or no a different girl, different girl. <laughs> she knows so she's a, uh she she knows the story i went to college and knew I liked science and sort of liked being outside. My dad's a science teacher. Um, and I definitely was sort of drawn to the science department. And I started just studying biology, but I didn't know. I, I thought it would be cool to be a park ranger or a forest ranger and wear a uniform and a gun and tell people what they can and can't do. And um, uh, I always just drawn towards animals and being outside and hiking and things. And then um, started taking some pretty challenging math classes and chemistry classes. And we would get into little groups and have group study sessions. And there was a girl named Jana um, who's 
dad had become a doctor later in life and that's the track she was on mm. and they and the reason she was doing is she was going to become a doctor and move to Africa and wow. be a doctor okay so she she knew that's what she was going to do wow and I um, I remember studying and she like looked up on one time when we were studying together and just said well, what are you gonna do what you, you're on all this biology what are you gonna do why don't you become a doctor and I was like okay I mean in not for any particular reason, but I had very little experience with doctors growing up. I, I only remember even going to the doctor once or twice. Um, and I think it was mainly just because my dad didn't want to spend the money to do right. it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we weren't like real, real, real healthy people, but um, um, had never been to the doctor, didn't have any doctors in the family, didn't have a lot of medical experience. Um, so it was really the first time I even considered it, like midway through college. And so I was like, oh, that's a good idea. Um, so I went up to the local hospital and I said, can I come volunteer and just see what it's like? And first they said no, but I was um, persistent. They mm -hmm. let me come and volunteer in the emergency room. And then just one thing led to another. And I was like, oh, I kind of like this. I think I could do this. And, uh, um, and then this girl, we re we remained friends. She went on into medical school, ended up moving to Africa, not finishing becoming a doctor, oh, but wow. moving to Africa anyway. She got married, lived there for a while. And um, anyway, so she got me headed on the doctor path, and then she did something different. Did but, she get you headed on the Uganda path too, or was that... Yeah, so she did? moved to Uganda, Yeah, and then her mom was an advisor at the college, and part uh, and then about a year into med school I went back and I said hey I'm really bored with just studying books all the time I want to get some experience and she said well why don't you um there's a there was actually a pediatrician working with um this group in Uganda where my friend Jana was and mm -hmm. I emailed him and he said yeah if you want to come hang out with me for a month you can do that um so that's how I ended up in Africa. And then you met Sarah in Africa? I actually, so Sarah, we met at college. Okay. I've, I've heard the story. I think I remember yeah. you, you traipsing through Africa to, yeah, to court her. Yeah, it's essentially like that. Did, yeah. yeah. So, so I knew her as friends in college, but she went to Africa independently um, and was living in Kenya. And I was visiting a friend in Uganda. Okay. And I went through a lot to find her in Kenya. It was it was quite a trek. <laughs> How long were you guys in Africa before you came back here? Um, so we ended up moving over there and living there for five years. And how many kids? You have three or four? We had three when we moved. Three when you moved. Over and then you had a, a few, two while we two were there. there. And then you mm -hmm. came back here when Caleb was born. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Do you miss being in Africa at all? I do. I miss parts of it. Mm -hmm. Um... Um, the, the, the people are amazing. The, the pace of life is amazing. Yeah. Um, the, the place where we live, just the, the environment, the scenery, the weather was just amazing. Um, just, I mean, we lived an hour from a game park. So, I mean, I could literally like wake up drive an hour and see lions mm. and zebra and elephants and things like that. Um, and that's just yeah, incredible. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, well, let's uh, shift gears for a little bit. Yeah. I don't know how much time we have, but so we're sitting here together. You know, we got our six feet yeah, ish. Oh yeah. Yeah. ish. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and we didn't have to do it this way. Mm -hmm. We could have done it through Skype or Zoom yeah. Yeah. or you know, some other way we could have set it on the porch, but I've consulted my doctor. Yeah. And my doctor was fine <laughs> with it. He said, no, he said, you yeah. should do your interview um, yeah. together. Yeah. And uh, so we are. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about that. I, I know you and I know <clears throat> some of your views. You've shared a little bit with me. Yeah. You, you know, everybody has an opinion. Um, not everybody gets to share their opinion. Right. Not everybody wants to share their opinion because yeah. a lot of people, if it's not the popular opinion it's, yeah. it's very very difficult right now um but i care a lot about your opinion because you're uh, you know you're 
you you want a lot of the same things out of life that myself that I do. Um, a lot of our friends are we're we're friends because I I think we God sort of put us all together our porch time group, a bunch of men, because even though we have different backgrounds, I think what we're looking for out of life is real similar. You know, we we all want to simplify. We want to get closer to the land, closer to God, closer to our families. We want to enjoy more of the good stuff. We we want to pull away from the rat race a little bit. And um, and in that, you know, we get together still with some distance. We've been getting together a little bit and having conversations about this because most of us are all by ourselves right now. Um, I've also found that uh, during this time, this quarantine looks different all the way up and down this road and every road in America. Um, I have one daughter who is in Alabama, as you know, her and her husband, and I really haven't seen her in six weeks Mm -hmm. because she won't come up here. Um, She won't really hardly leave her house. And that's how they're choosing to handle this. Um, I know a lot of other people who are doing it completely different and they set some, some limitations uh, where they limit the amount of people they're around and it's, it's complicated and it's confusing. I have my own path that I've been going down and my, my family's here. I have two sisters, one on each side and uh, not everybody's in agreement, <clears throat> but we are in agreement that this is a very strange time. And as hard as it is, and as frustrating as it is, it's been really good to be at home and be together. Yeah. And and realize how special it can be to just be. Yeah. And, you know, we've, India and I have taken a pretty long media fast also. We've stopped, She's she, she had a serious like Disney withdrawals, like Frozen yeah. 2, oh, That's Papa, it. Frozen <laughs> 2. Somebody brought, or my, uh, my brother-in-law dropped a bunch of waters off to us the other day and on the water you know the the container that has the the little wrap that goes around all the water bottles they they put frozen two pictures on it indy lost her mind it's like these are the greatest waters in the world papa more frozen two waters but what's happened i mean it is so neat for me is in the last few weeks Indy's personality has changed so much. Like the the way that she looks me in the eye and talks to me and the 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 way that we spend time together is not the way that it was before. Like she is experiencing things different. I'm experiencing things differently with her with all my family uh, my family and uh, the the few people that I'm around. And it's been really good. Yeah. It's been really good. You know, you're like me. In some ways, it doesn't change a lot because yeah. we are already making a lot of these decisions. Right. But different than me, you are someone that people really look up to, not just uh, someone they admire and they're interested in your opinion, but y- your opinion really matters mm-hmm. in a real um, important way to them. So share with me where you are. You know where you are today, and and whether that's changed from the beginning. Like, what are your thoughts about uh, your understanding of the virus? Your understanding of what we're doing about the virus? You know, anything else you want to share? Yeah. Well, uh, early on, I you know people were asking me who should we look to to get information, and my answer is there is there are no coronavirus experts on you know there, it's, this is new. It's a new thing. Um, it's, that's not happened in a long time. And the, the blessing in all this is that we have so much information, but that's also the curse too. Yeah. We don't know who to trust. And I think that some of us are, um, are, you know, unsure if, the information, you know, how to how to interpret the information we're getting. Um, do people are people presenting us a story, or are they presenting us facts? Right. And um, so I've spent a ton of time just looking at different, you know, different resources, and I've spent way more time than I want to on the computer lately um, because people are asking. 
Right. And um, so there's there's a great Venn diagram my wife posted on Facebook, which she, she's even been on the computer more lately. And it's three intersecting circles. And in the middle is me. And one of the circles is, you know, I think that the virus is significant and and I do care about people's health. I, I'm, I'm, I care. And the other one is I also care about, you know, um, individual liberties and the freedoms and the things that, you know, are important from, mm -hmm. from that perspective. The third was, you know, you know, social interactions and things. And so I think that what I have encouraged people to think about is, of course, I'm I'm tending to present things from the circle of the medical and protecting people. Right. But I encourage people to think about, you, you know, the the ability to hold all of those things together, and um, you know the the importance of liberty and the importance of having social interactions with your family and friends, and the importance of loving your neighbor in the sense that you're not, you know, you don't want them to get sick. Right. Um, and you want to protect yourself. And um, so the, the what, you know, what, what I'm, what I am wading through is what seems to be differences even within the country. I mean, certainly New York and New Jersey seem to be, if I lived there, I don't know that I would be sitting here with you necessarily. Right. But I, you know, but I live here, and it, it's rare to hear of somebody around here that's sick. And so, um, I've I've encouraged people to look at, you know, their unique situation, look at things here locally, um, and do. Do what's and do what's do the next best thing. Do what's right for them. Mm -hmm. And as with so many things that I think that we sh we share is not try not to be make decisions because you're afraid of something. Right. Um, yeah. That 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 tends to me to feel um, to get us into trouble. Um, uh, making decisions out of fear. Yeah. Um, I think make decisions out of love or compassion or concern or things like that um so i have been so i did my good two weeks um you know and i was home more and it's been nice honestly like you said i mean we've been home a little bit more than we would be normally um but honestly i've started being with people more this past few days mm -hmm. um and i think i think people are aware now of the risk and i and they know what they're know if, if they know what they're getting into <laughs> if they want to come over we sure. we have people outside and um, so I've been doing that more it's my opinion that we're all going to be exposed to this virus a lot like we're exposed to colds and flus and things like that um, and most of us are not gonna get that sick from it I think that for most people that I know and ourselves the 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 harm of continuing to not see your friends, not see um, neighbors, for us is probably worse than the risk of, mm -hmm. of getting sick. Do you feel like, you, you told us, um, you kind of have some ideas of, you, if, if it were your, your plan, yeah. do you, I guess uh, Trump uh, rolled out something yesterday, how do you yeah. feel about that? Um, I, it seems to be good. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what I've been saying for several weeks now. Yeah, you, um, you know, we need to start the, yeah. bringing people back yep. to work. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's it's opening it, up. Yeah, it seems like a good compromise. Is I mean, we know who's vulnerable. Um, are there people that don't fit those categories that seem to get sick? Rarely, yes, I think so. But we know who's vulnerable. I think we ought, we ought to take you know good care of the vulnerable people, the the elderly those with um, a lot of underlying health conditions protect them like mm -hmm. we always try yeah. to do those that don't seem uh, likely to be susceptible or those that seem to have gotten may have gotten it already and are recovering uh, I think that they can start getting back out in society and, and start working and I that seems like a, a reasonable and a, a wise compromise yeah that's awesome do you, um, 
<clears throat> when you look at the numbers of everything, does it is it hard for you? Does it make sense and not make sense? You know, the the actions, reactions that we've taken. Uh, does it feel? I mean, you know the numbers and understand what they mean a lot more than someone like I, yeah. I would. Yeah. What's what's your take on all that? Um. It the yeah the numbers right now for the people who are sick and positive cases and have have died from this don't uh, don't match the the response that we've had essentially um, and I think there's a there's a there's there's a number of reasons for that right. I think but yeah. um, thankfully it hasn't been nearly as bad as yeah, as some people sure. predicted for sure yeah. it seems like it's it's caused a lot of you know, we were already an anxiety-filled world. I mean, yeah. incredibly anxiety-filled. It yeah. feels like it's at epidemic levels yeah. already, yeah. long before this came. So, yeah. worries me a little bit just how <clears throat> how how we recover from this. And yeah, there's a lot of fear that that I don't think is going to go away. You know, right. that won't go away for a while anyway. Yeah. So, I mean, people have wondered if we're going to shake hands for. A while again and yeah. you know and I know that you I mean one of your favorite greetings is giving someone a big hug yeah <laughs> that's gotta be a hard for you I have a hard time with not being given the opportunity to assess my own risk you know like I'm well aware yeah. of I don't I don't follow the news that much right. I try and stay away from it but I I paid attention more than normal yeah. these are the kind of things that are mostly just frustrate you more than anything else which is why yeah. I don't pay that much attention but I understand what's going on um, and at the end of the day you know I I understand the risk and that that's for my little one that's for my my other children but you know every day feels like a risk to me getting in my car is a risk um, I don't know what's gonna happen I mean I'm I'm always well aware you know when you're when your wife is buried in the field behind you and she was ten times more healthy than you and 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 did everything right it just reminds me and she was so young that you just don't know what tomorrow uh, looks like and i i gotta have a certain amount of trust and faith and i just don't want to remove that out of caution you know i could i don't even know how to function we've talked about that it's like without faith i don't even know how to how to get by a day let alone you know something like this i i just I just feel like at some point it's going to come down to our own personal choices and do the best we can and you know and it'll it'll be what it's going to be. So, but I appreciate all your you've been helpful to me and so many people just trying to keep a little bit of a lid on things because people they don't know what to think and sometimes you just have to surround yourself with some people who are a little smarter or they look a little harder and understand the numbers a little bit more. And so it's been really helpful to me to have your advice and your input. Happy to do it in ways I feel like it's a big responsibility that oh, yeah, makes I me nervous. Yeah. I mean, there's gonna be a lot of people mad at me if you get sick. <laughs> there's gonna be a lot, of, yeah. <laughs> Isn't that a funny thing? Yeah. It's, uh, well, I won't tell them if I get sick. <laughs> okay. I'm glad to spend time with you. You know, I. I love uh, getting to sit down and share and um, hear a little bit of your story, get to share a little bit of your story. And um, I'm excited what God's doing in your life and the ways that you're helping so many people out there look at medicine a little differently, look at health a little bit differently. And, you know, I, I think that's amazing. Like You've turned a corner. Has this been exciting for you the last number of years? It really has. I bet it has. Yeah. Um... It, it allows me to blend my love for community and neighbors and the land and farming and agriculture and healthy food and medicine and blend that all together. Um, and I just, I, I can't think of a better way to do it. Yeah. Well, you're doing an amazing job. I, for me, it feels like uh, even in 2020, we still have a local doctor, you know, a community doctor who is trying to do some things that haven't been done in a while. You know, I feel like we can have a relationship with a doctor who come to the house. You know, like it literally feel like uh, if I needed to, I could just trade eggs for, for some, like, that's what's really great is it's like you're, you're reinventing uh, your profession 
and in a lot of ways is just going back to basics and the way things have been done in the past. And um, I, I just think it's special. Yeah. I've got a couple other last questions okay. for you. Um, if you weren't a doctor, mm -hmm. what would you be? Farmer. Would you be a farmer? Oh, yeah. Really? Yes. Easy. Hey, would you have always had that answer? Do no. You think? No. No. I That's grew up fairly in a, recent. I, right? That is a recent thing. I uh, I grew up in a densely packed neighborhood. I th you know I'm, I think we had a couple tomatoes in the yard once in a while, a little little bitty garden, um, and I did not know any farmers. So I moved from Delaware, pretty urban area. To Arkansas, and I remember driving from Memphis to Little Rock, and like seeing fields with white stuff all over them, and not knowing it was cotton. And like a friend of mine from Jackson, Tennessee, teaching me like what a I didn't know I never knew what a, a combine was. I never I'm not sure I had ever seen a tractor until I went to college. Yeah, um, and just knew nothing about where my food came from how it was you know what farmers did and um and 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 honestly in wretched probably looking down on farmers honestly yeah. yeah uh just yeah it's kind of what you did if you weren't smart enough or you weren't educated and you're a farmer it's just kind of your last resort um if you can't buy your food then well i guess you're gonna have to grow it yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. so um but then just as i got into medicine and really realized what health was and where health actually came from and a good chunk of it was what you put in your body what you ate and how good or bad that was um, mm -hmm. and then honestly then living overseas living in Africa where most people were farmers and I ended up teaching as a part of our health curriculum agriculture mm -hmm. and then well you know that one of my biggest heroes in the world yeah. is Joel Salatin now yeah. And started, you know, reading his books and watching movies and interviews that he was in. Um, and then I stalked him. And then I went to his farm. I know, like you and Joey did. And um, and it just, uh, you know, he. Anyway, so he he played a big part in transforming the way I think about farmers. And now it's the opposite. They are the smartest people. I mean, yes, they may not have tons of college degrees but just smart resourceful can fix anything know the land love the land um just you know tough tough people tough work i've been making a tv show i think you saw the episode that yeah. you're a part of because yeah. in the fall we got to go visit joel salatin and you jumped on the bus with us and um yeah it's amazing because i'm just like you he's He's an inspiration for a bunch of reasons, not just in farming, just and to spend more time around him. You see, he's he he lives it really, really well. I'm like you. Um, you know, I I am, you know, I'm kind of a part time farmer. Whatever I'm doing, it's like I I don't know if I could do it completely. I don't I don't feel like God has given me that calling to do it completely. Uh, but right now, we are definitely doing it more than ever, and I think that's been a really cool thing to see people questioning where their food comes from. And we have huge gardens started, bigger than Joey and I have ever made before. We've been yesterday. We were putting up fencing for cows. We've we've not had uh, pasture raised beef before. We're working on pigs. We have tons of chickens. Like we're headed down that road, and a lot of it is is that it was kind of hobby farming before, but with Everything going on right now, you just realize, not just me, but all my family, the young, younger, uh, my nieces and nephews and everybody, they're all starting to realize, wow, this is a skill we probably need to know because this might happen again. I spent my whole life, tr I, I had this vision of what extraordinary was because I, I was wanted to be a singer, you know, so in my mind, it was for sure going to be on a stage with 20,000 people applauding and you know, all those kinds of things that you naturally could be on a baseball diamond it could be whatever all that stuff is and I remember thinking that anything else didn't feel extraordinary it's like and I, I was terrified of, of 
living an average life. And, but what's really weird is God has like flipped everything on its head. And now all of that stuff feels like, yeah, like that's fine. Like everybody, everybody likes that. Like it's, I see why it's, it's uh, sparkly and, and it seems like a great thing. But to me, it doesn't feel extraordinary. Yeah. Now, uh, when I see a farmer or someone like that who has lived in the same home and they've, they've chosen a simpler lifestyle mm-hmm. and they, their value system stays intact even as the world is changing and changing and and it it feels like what they're doing is, is is extraordinary it's like it doesn't feel like what i've done before or like what we were paying attention to on the news is extraordinary anymore it doesn't feel that way to me it feels like what's extraordinary looks totally different now and and i love that i love it so a couple other things what are your top three favorite movies if you had to pick um, I, top three, I like the movie I Am Legend with Will Smith. You talked about that the other day. I've seen that. I, I mean, it's, a, it it's, partic- it's a little bit more appropriate right now. Yeah, right now. it's yeah. a, basically a, a virus that goes crazy in, yeah. New, I think, New York maybe or something. Yeah. Um, but what I love about that movie is, you know, he, essentially he, these people are, are trying to destroy him. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The earth sort of people. Yeah. And, but he has decided to stay there and remain and try to help them. Um, so it's a little bit, it feels appropriate, like sort of as, as a doctor, not that my, I, my patients aren't all trying to destroy me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I a couple it. of them yeah. maybe, but not, not as a whole. Um, um, but I, 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 uh, I love that movie just because I feel like it's, it's, you know, it's some self-sacrifice on his part and, you know, and it's, it's just a cool movie. Um, um, there's a movie called Never Cry Wolf. It came out like in the 80s, a Disney movie. And I used to actually resent it because my dad kind of made me watch it. It was one of his favorite movies. Um, but it's a story of this um, this uh, researcher basically moving by himself up into the Arctic Circle and studying wolves. Folks thought wolves were decimating the caribou population. Uh, but he went up to study them and ended up having this just amazing experience and understanding the wolves on a deeper level. Mm. Um, and realizing that they were actually helping the caribou population by eliminating the weak, and and it's just a fun, wow. neat story. I've never heard of that. One. Yeah, it's a good one. Um, my third one. Let's see. Um, I can watch Band of Brothers over and over. Yeah. Um, and so I feel like those are very three three very different They're movies. They're totally different. <laughs> um, so so I can I mean I have Band of Brothers and I can I mean probably every few months I could just put it in. What do you love them. about that so much? Part of it is I, I anytime I see a war movie, I I, I think it helps it, it it makes me look at myself and say right. would I be brave enough to put myself in that situation? Right. And. Um, so I think it's a challenge for me personally, like how brave could I be if the situation called for it and to be able to feel that close to a group of right. men or, or your, you know, yeah. you know like fam, almost like closer than brothers, I guess, which yeah, is sort sure. of what the poem, I mean, the poem's yeah. about. Um, so just the, how would I deal with that stress and being in that situation, you know, far from home and, um, but also what kind of connection would I have with that group of people? In a way, it makes me think of our porch group a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it kind, of, it kind of does. When you were saying that, yeah. that's kind of as close as we probably are going to get to it right now. Yeah. Last question. Uh, I, I've never got to do this before and, and sit and really talk to someone. And I thought, well, I was remembering we did this. We had our own TV show for a while called The Joy and Roy Show. And we ended every episode with her and I. She would sing a little bit of That's Important to Me. And we would always say, you know, don't forget about what's most important to you. And it was the only time we spoke to an audience. And it felt strangely important. It felt like that's what it was all about at the end of the day. That made me think about you uh, and just sitting here. And I wanted to ask you, you know, what do you think it's all about? Number one, what what it you know life in general and it changes when none of us really know. But if yeah. you said, this is what I think it's all about, yeah. and in conjunction with that, like, 
what is what's important to you personally what's what are some of the things that are most important to you so with the social distancing right now going on our 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 governor and other local leaders have decided it's not appropriate to meet as a church and that's been tough yeah for us our family i mean they're they're um they're doing online and live streaming and stuff like that and i've watched it but it feels different i cannot get it's just i can't get into it um and so that that and that has been something that growing up has just been a part of my life every sunday and often more has been a part of my life um, it feels like, you know, my relationship with God and, um, my, my position in relationship to him and remembering the blessings that he's given me and the opportunities, um, I, be- I believe has probably shaped, shaped most or all of the decisions that I've made. Mm-hmm. At least I want I want it to, mm-hmm. um, and um, I think ultimately, like when all of the other distractions and things sort of get stripped away, you know, that feels like one thing that will remain um, is is my relationship with Him, mm-hmm. and um, it's. It's not an easy relationship. <laughs> it's a difficult one for a lot of reasons. Um, but that that has certainly been fa- grounding and foundational. And th- I believe that probably, like I said, does sort of propel, drive most of the, at least the good decisions that I've made in my life. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think I would be a very different person if that was not case yeah that's what's been hard probably hardest for me too is is church not just not going to church but not really being what the words allowed or um what's the word used a minute ago it's like it's it's uh it's frowned upon um yeah that's been difficult because at the end of the day like it doesn't really matter it could be this bad could be a thousand times worse like faith is the only thing that's going to help me and to say that it's the same if I watch <clears throat> if I watch online or if I don't gather around with people or I don't I don't know that it's the same it's not the same for me I, I you know I don't know that I need to be at Walmart but I feel like I need to be at church you know and uh, we'll have to work on that yeah, let's do that. I'm game. <laughs> I know you are. Yeah. Thank you again for coming to sit down with me today. This is my first time to, to do a podcast, and um, I like this. Yeah, it was it's fun. It's fun. Thank you. It's yeah. good to be with you. I feel like we we see each other a lot, but like I said, I mean, I haven't probably sat and talked to you for an hour in a long time. Yeah, a long time. So we'll have to do this fun. again. I appreciate you having me. It's yeah. Fun. Let's get our kiddos together soon. Definitely. You let me know when. All right. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm ready. All right. See you then. All right. Take care. E-N-C-O-U-R-A-G-I-N-G. Encouraging. Positive and giving hope for future success. Promising. It was for me. See you tomorrow.